Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the Doctors. This evening, I am going to be sharing the tea of the day. Today, I decided to stop by Quick Trip. If you all know, this is one of my favorite spots to get my teas. So I am simply sipping on energy green tea from Quick Trip. Stay tuned. When we return, we will be discussing African Americans in law enforcement. Stay tuned. If you love them enough to relearn math so you can teach them math, then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're correctly buckled in the back seat. Welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the Doctors. Of course, I am here with my wonderful co-host. Hey, Dr. Singleton. What's up, Dr. What's Tish? Up? Hey, Dr. Smith. Good evening. What's going on? Mm -hmm. So this evening, we have the pleasure to have with us in the studio, Major Derek Wise. Welcome to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the Doctors. It's so good to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, very nice listen, to be with you. We are very excited to have you here in the studio with yes, us this yeah. evening. And so this evening, we are going to be discussing African Americans in law enforcement. Okay. So Major Wise, I would just like to start with just a simple question. What made you want to go into law enforcement? Well, you know, I've, uh, being in law enforcement for over 30 years now, uh, years ago, I made the decision to go into law enforcement, actually when I was about 16 years old, when I was fortunate enough to see one of the black troopers that lived in our community. I saw how, you know, well-dressed he was and how he looked in his uniform and everything like that. And he represented something that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So in looking at that, I you know, made my choice at that point to do everything that I could to try to, to build my skill set that I can be considered for that. Um, more so to represent our community because again, we did not see a lot of African Americans yes, in sure. law enforcement. So uh, with that in mind, you know, I've always had kind of the service mindset of, of serving, mm -hmm. so that was that was an opportunity to do that. So seeing that and then wanting to to be more active in the community, I thought that I could be be representative at that time. So. Right. I heard you say that you have been doing this for thirty years. Yes. So to do anything for thirty years, you really have to have a passion for it. Definitely. So can you give me what would you say over the years? What have been what have been some of the challenges that you face being in law enforcement? Well, and, and Dr. Tish, you definitely hit on the, you know, on the head when you said that it's it's a career. Mm -hmm. uh, law enforcement is not for everybody, so it's it's picking and choosing what you want to do. Um, and when you're passionate at something, you will give your all. You will make sure that you are dedicating everything you can to develop your craft. So that's through training. That's through opportunities. That's making sure that you are representative of not only first of all your last name as a person, but also your agency and the profession as a whole. So um, some of the challenges in law enforcement continues to be um, trying to come up with that balance and that model of policing that provides the best service for the community. Mm -hmm. So that's always the challenge, um, but being able to get out and speak on formats such as this, right. uh, being able to be active in the community and, and being a part of the human element of a community is very important. So that's kind of how you overcome those challenges. But, but I look at challenges as opportunities, to be honest with you, because that's an opportunity to grow. Uh, that's an opportunity to get better at what we do. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what law enforcement has involved, evolved in in the 30 years that I've seen it, is that we've continued to evolve to make sure that we are, you know, trying to model what right looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't always been able to do that. Uh, and there's an acknowledgement of that at certain levels, but we also have to continue to, to have that look in the mirror to see what are we doing and what we can excel in and make better. Okay, so. all right, so I'll yield the floor to my co-host. Sure. Um, uh, 
Brother Wise, let's uh, let's cut to third base, um, and I want to ask uh, a question here. Um, you know, statistics show that um, African Americans are, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever uh, the statistics show, are much more likely than our white counterparts or uh, others to be pulled over by the police. Uh, you know, to have negative interactions with the police uh, and things of that nature. Um, tell me about, you know, some of those uh, experiences. Tell me, you know, uh, uh, you know what, what is it that we, you know, as African Americans, you know, what, what, what should we be doing in, in those kinds of situations? You know, are we, you know, should we fear the police? You know, should we... Uh, you know, how, how should we conduct ourselves during just a normal traffic stop? Mm -hmm. You know, well, what are the things that we can help our brothers uh, uh, with, with doing? Well, that's a great question, Doctor. You kind of you kind of answer asked a multi-layered cake yeah, question. I, I laid so, it on you. So, yes, let, sir. so let me let me try to dissect that a little bit. But you know, certainly the, the question is there. Starting with how you conduct yourself in a traffic stop, I think that's probably the easiest. Uh -huh. uh, what's going to to be the most effective? for not only black motorists, or any motorists for that matter, is to be non-confrontational at any traffic stop you come to. Uh, that encounter is never going to be good if it's confrontational, if that means anything. So, so whether you are in agreement with the traffic stop or not, that is not the format at that particular point in time to try to air that grievance or what have you. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that a traffic stop is only a traffic stop. It does not mean guilt. So there are, are remedies for if you believe that what you're being stopped for, you are not guilty of, you're innocent of. So that portion of it, I would encourage anyone, not only black motorists, but any motorist, in any situation where you were pulled over, pull over to where it is safe, and then be as non-confrontational and as non-threatening as you can be, if that makes sense. That will, will make sure, or at least increase the likelihood that the encounter won't go bad. Okay. Uh, there are many instances, again, to where we can probably talk for four hours about why traffic stops go bad, but a lot of time it's a breakdown in communication. So once the breakdown in communication comes, which can, which can add to a lot of different reasons why that happened, not just race, but it could be, again, a lack of understanding of the culture of the people that you're dealing with. So again, acknowledging some of those things that we have seen, we've tried to address those through training and through different exposures so that folks can kind of see people different than they are, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So getting an understanding of the folks you are policing from the police side makes a big difference in being able to, again, present a model that is a, a policing model that has the perception and also the reality of being consistent and fair. And that's what people want. Mm -hmm. So we found that through data that they don't it, just treat me the same, mm -hmm. treat me with respect, and that goes both ways. So, so that, those encounters are there. As far as the t statistics regarding the traffic stop data, uh, without seeing that, you know, certainly I can't comment or get too far in the weeds on that, but sure. if you are stopped, the first thing I will encourage everyone is to first of all get legal. Mm -hmm. So if your driver's license is legal or is valid, your plates are squared away, you got your insurance, you got all of the different things that is required by law, then even if you are stopped, then again, that encounter is a lot better than you trying to defend the fact you don't have a valid driver's license. There's no defense of that. Uh, you're putting the police officer in the position to do his job, which again, it's unpleasant for anyone to go to jail or anything like that. But if you haven't done the things and taken accountability for making sure that you are legal, Mm -hmm. then it makes it tough. So in order for you to produce or to think someone is wrong, you need to be in a position of right. So if you're legal, then mm -hmm. if you get pulled over, a police officer can't say that your, your uh, license is not valid, right. if it is in fact valid. So being right and acting right is, is huge. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sure. Mm -hmm. so. sure. sure. Okay, Dr. Smith. Um, Major Wise, I have watched you and you have watched me. We have growing up through the ranks together. You are a true stand-up kind of guy. Thank you. I have a 17-year-old um, son, and he hangs out with his friends. Mm -hmm. And to, to Dr. Um, Singleton's point, there are stigmatisms that are out there that 
our young black men either don't like the police based upon what they've seen, what they've heard. You know, they fear the police because of what they've seen, what they heard. The police fear these young black boys just because of mm -hmm. how they look. You know, the, you know, the braids in their hair, because that's what they do. That's what they like now. Not just them, younger men, you know, men. How can we, in your opinion, this is strictly your opinion, break down these barriers because I'm not fearful of being stopped. Mm -hmm. I'm not. My son is riding right, but I don't know how he feels. Sure. I don't know how his friends feel, and I feel in my heart of hearts that they could be fearful. Mm -hmm. What can we do as a platform? What could we partner with? What do you see? If, if Thomas was your son, what would be some of the things, because you're a stand-up guy, what would you tell these young black men that are out here that when they see the police, they immediately mm -hmm. don't like you just because you got this uniform on, just because you're in a car, you know, it, their radar goes off. What would you tell them? Certainly. And, and, and that is a, a real perception and that is a real concern in the minds of a lot of people. Um, I would I would tell and encourage just like I did my own sons is that don't model an image that you don't you know want or think that it's going to represent you so in other words if you're modeling an image or a conduct that is you know could be perceived as a threat okay. or you know gangster like okay. uh, all of the different things that will bring about that stigma per se, then a lot of people who don't know you will automatically look at you and make a judgment of you based on how you look. Okay. So that's a human thing. That's We all do that because we perceive what we believe is right, what is wrong, what's uh, intimidating and the likes. So I would encourage them to, to take a look at who you're modeling. Okay. Are you, are you modeling a person that is, you know, going to school, uh, going, you know, business-like or what have you, or are you modeling someone that is a gangster, or are you on Facebook with, you know, two guns in your hands, all those different types mm -hmm. of things, are you flashing money, mm -hmm. all of the different things that could potentially feed into the stereotype. Okay. Um, you want to be able to, in any situation, have someone look at you and be able to give you the benefit of the doubt. Okay. When you take that away from them by, again, look like, act like, talk like, it's really tough to now back down from that when you, again, a police officer, you can't assume that a police officer knows you. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage that part first. Okay. Second, I would have that conversation in the home with my youngster, and I would explain to them what that could be perceived as and what that could be and the consequences of that. Okay. Um, there is, he shouldn't, they should not fear the police, but they certainly should respect what happens and, and what goes on and what policing is. Explain to them what policing is. Can A you lot. define policing for Absolutely. us? Because I don't even know. I know when I get pulled over, I'm trying sure. to be as nice as I can. Sure. So that's and, me, though. And you know? also, Major to address what Dr. Smith just said. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take a short break and when we come back, I want to continue that conversation of the fear mm -hmm. that they have yes. of police. Okay? Okay. Stay tuned, we'll be right back with Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors. How are you doing? Hey Mason. Hey Mason. Thank you. A place to make my own. A place that I call home. This place that I call home. Welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors. If you are just tuning in, we are discussing tonight African Americans in law enforcement. And before the break, Dr. Smith asked Major Wise the question, what is policing? So Major, can you address that for us? Thank you, Doc. Policing in its most rawest form is the process of, of providing safety to the community through partnering with the community and by providing that 
that, that dovetail of, of making sure that people are safe and serving the community. So those are the, that's basically what policing is. It's, it's a model providing for the opportunity for, to protection of individual liberties so that you will be able to go about your business, you'll be able to sit in your home, on your patio deck with your family without worrying about you know, someone or an intruder coming in and again infringing upon your, your liberties you know, to the pursuit of happiness. So that's the, in its raw sense. Policing for most folks is the uniform, it's the presence of the police and those types of things. So making sure that we, we are submitting to a codified set of laws that the people we elect go and they produce and making sure that everyone is holding to those standards that we as citizens we produce everything from the United States Constitution all the way to individual constitutions throughout the United States. Okay, so Major, how do you all, as African Americans in this brown uniform, how do you all gain that trust with these young men in our communities? How do you all gain that trust knowing how they feel about the police right now? By every, by one interaction at a time. Every single interaction I have, whether it's on a traffic stop or whether it's, it's uh, dealing with something else, is important of how I treat that person, how I look in uniform, how I talk to them and everything. Not only that, it's how I treat them when I'm out of uniform. I happen to belong to the community, and I still live in the community that I'm from, so people get to see me, mm -hmm. they get to see the human side outside of the uniform. Okay. We've got to understand that, that showing our human side humanizes us. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not robots and that, you know, many, a lot of men and women put on the uniform and the badge every single day. And behind this, this badge and behind the, the patch is a beating heart of a human being. Mm -hmm. And so trying to provide that through partnering with stakeholders, going to a lot of the different things, becoming little league coaches, participating in political uh, a venues within your community, um, just doing things and, and having a conversation with folks, showing them that you are listening to some of their concerns and addressing some of their concerns. That's how I believe you build trust. You build trust by having positive conversations before bad things happen. Therefore, you have the ability to, when something does happen, you're able to at least have a conversation about it. So many times people are so ready to take sides and stay mm -hmm. on that side. Mm -hmm. But there has to be a meeting in the middle in order to gain trust. Trust is a two-way street. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> it's not given, but it's earned. Right. So therefore, as the support of the police and the community grows, the police start to trust the community. And that's, it's a proven fact that if you look at the communities that are successful, those relationships between the community and the police are there because of having those personal interactions with the police that are non quote unquote enforcement. Right. So those times where their lights are not on, they're mm -hmm. just having a cup of coffee with a right. citizen. They're talking to a business owner. They're talking to a homeowner when it's not business as usual. Okay. So that's how you build trust, one public interaction at a time. All right, Dr. Singleton. You know, um, Major Wise, uh, you hit on a very important uh, uh, conversation with trust. Um, let me ask the question that, that so many of our viewers are probably wanting to ask, uh, and that's that good cop versus bad cop uh, scenario. Tell me why, uh, uh, why, why you know, do we have uh, bad cops, if you will? What, what could cause a cop to go bad uh, and, 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 and touch on that for me? Again, absolutely, good question. And again, it goes back to the human factor. A police officer do not become a robot. So whenever you become a police officer, you bring your, your ideas of what integrity is, you bring your ideas of what work ethic is, what right and wrong is. So you can't train integrity. Hmm. You, you either have it or you don't. You, right. can't, you can't train moral compass. You either have it or you don't. Hmm. So therefore, you have folks that unfortunately will, will meet, you know, they will go under the gate. They will, they will camouflage themselves to where they are making it through the process they will end up as police officers, however, and then until the bad thing happens, you just, just don't know. So it, it's, a, it's a trust relationship until it, it happens. So it's almost like, you know, as long as everything is running fine, then you think it's fine. So 
individuals make individual decisions and unfortunately some people choose to make bad decisions. I can tell you as a police officer and I can probably speak for hundreds that there's nothing worse to a good police officer with integrity than a bad police officer yeah. mm. because that 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 bad act has a ripple effect. You can't drop a rock in a, a river and it just swallows, it, it ripples. Right. And so we understand that. We understand the value of the fact of being able to have integrity, builds trust in the community, and every single time you have that, that small interaction that is a bad one, it supersedes all of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of daily interactions to where police officers are doing it right. So we, we have a, a recognition of that, and any time we see that, we do and we move swiftly to try to move that person and hold that person accountable. So to, so to piggyback off of um, Dr. Singleton, so right now, mental health is a huge issue because of the pandemic and everything that we have going on, the good cop, bad cop. What do you do, um, Major Wise, to keep your mental, because do you ever become scared or upset when you see these things happening across our nation, in our communities where the bad cop has acted out. Now you have this uproar with these people. They're upset. They're coming after you. What do you do for your mental health? How do you remain that man of integrity still and not want to turn to the bad cop? Because it could, it could be probably like a light switch. You know, when you have people after you, when you haven't done anything, and this guy over here has, but you all have to remain as a united front. So... How do you keep your sanity? How do you keep wanting to put that badge on and wanting to keep the, you know, keeping the, the, the right attitude and wanting to police in the right way? Well, first off, it's, it's in my heart to do it. Mm -hmm. And I don't take any action that's against or anti-police personal. And so by doing that, that, that allows me to conceptualize exactly what it is and to not um, take it to where it it destroys me or it changes my my direction if that makes sense okay. so in doing that I also pray okay. uh, I am a man of God so I, I look at that as my my biggest factor in being able to to talk people through going back to my answer a little bit earlier having interactions with people prior to something bad happening or me actually having to come and put handcuffs on people understanding who I am as a person first as opposed to a law enforcement officer. Okay. That's what keeps me going and the fact that of all of the different cases that I've handled over the years, I know that there is somebody out there that's going to need me or a police officer like me to come to their aid to at a time, at the worst time in their life. Mm -hmm. So that's unfortunately it may be the homicide or the, the, the death of one of their kids, mm -hmm. their loved one. Or it may be something as simple as I'm on the side of the road, I'm in the middle of nowhere, I got two kids in the car, I got a flat tire. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's the range of being able to keep me going because I know it's going to be somebody out there. Because of the fact that I love doing what I do, that makes it easy for me to get up the next day, even in the most toughest times, and I've had those, mm -hmm. to be able to get up and know that I'm doing a noble job and I know it's a, it's a thankless job, but it's because I've been so blessed to do it. Um, I look at it in that the wholehearted way of doing it as opposed to someone who is, is emotionally drained mm -hmm. and looking for someone to lash out to. Mm -hmm. Are there sense. measures in place with the officers for when you do get yes. mentally drained? So well, you all, behind the scenes, you all have stuff to help you cope? 100%. Oh, uh, okay. Illinois State Police, we have a wellness program to where we have an opportunity for officers that feel that um, they are in need of, mm -hmm. um, That's good to know. you know, right. everything from a relationship to, hey, I just don't feel right. Mm -hmm. Teaching them and giving them the training to, to recognize, understand, hey, I don't feel right, and that's okay. Yep. So we try to take the stigma away from mental illness because it's real. Yes, and it so is. in having that, having that outlet and having it to where it's not you know, stigmatized. Mm -hmm. That has allowed us at the Illinois State Police to help our officers through some of the most critical incidents and some of the most personal incidents as well. So we look at the, the 360 of the, of the uh, person, not just, you know, a small snippet. We want 
the whole body. We want the whole mind connected because if you're, if you're worried about something at home, then guess what? You're not gonna be able to focus on the job. So we look right. at the, the wellness and well-being of all of our employees as supervisors and as, you know, as we go through as an agency, we make sure we do that. A lot of police departments have done that too because we realize that again, we're, we're not robots. We, right. we have you know, disappointments at home, we have stresses at home, we have divorces, we have financial mm -hmm. issues, we have all those different things. And oh, by the way, we gotta come out and deal with other people's Right. Mm -hmm. Different things too. Right. So, right. It, that in itself, that nucleus in itself drives a lot of the different things. So, through fitness and exercise, I will utilize that. And just through, again, prayer and meditation. That's just right understanding who I am is the biggest part of, of, of who I am, if that makes sense. Yes. And what I do. Right. Well, Major Wise, uh, I, I really consider this an honor because you, know, you and to Carol and myself, we actually yes. we went to school together, so we've yeah. been knowing each other a long time. A long yes. And then time. the four of us, we all grew up in you know these predominantly African American communities. Well, so absolutely. when people ask, you know, do good things come out of East St. Louis? Do absolutely. good things come out of Venice? Do absolutely. good things come out of Brooklyn? Yes, they do. Yes, and we all do. are a testament to that. That yes, they do. Well, so, Major. In 30 seconds, if there's a young man that's wanting to go into the law enforcement field, or for that young man that's fearful, what would you say to them? I would say in order for you to be a part of the solution, you need to become a representative of law enforcement. So that means staying out of trouble. That means looking for opportunities. The Illinois State Police is currently hiring. Uh, we are looking for minorities as well as women. So therefore, again, if you want to see more people, that look like you, then you're that person. So we are looking for you. If you are one of those who mm -hmm. wants to do that, starts off over $64,000 a year. That's pretty good for policing. So we are looking for that as well as other police departments. So um, take an opportunity, IllinoisTrooper.com. Uh, go on our website, take a look at that. But, but clearly, uh, policing is a, is a very rewarding career. Um, it is, I mean, a lot of things you will see it's personal growth, spiritual growth, and more importantly, it's, it's giving back to the community. So, right. so on behalf of Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors, we want to just thank you for taking time out of your yes, busy schedule you to come on our platform yes. and discuss being yes. an African American in law enforcement. Yes. Thank, thank you all for tuning in to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors. Remember to follow us on all of our social media platforms, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. You all stay safe and stay healthy. Bye, everyone. Thank you.